Okay, so kia ora koutou. Welcome to my talk, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. Welcome to Drupal South as well. Um, I'm going to be going through a couple of things today. So I'm going to be presenting a couple of New Zealand government websites for our client, Toitu to Fenware Land Information New Zealand. And so these are the, the flagship lins.gov.nz site and also charts.lins.gov.nz. I'll be talking about them from a project management perspective as well. And um, before I get into that, a little bit about myself. So hi there, everyone. My name's Jack Kilborn. I know a few of you here. I see some of the Sparks team who I see with on a daily basis, but I'll give you a wave everywhere anyway. I see part of the Linz team here, so I'll give you guys a wave as well. And everyone else, nice to meet you. Uh, my name's Jack, as I said. You might be able to tell from my accent that I'm not from around these ways. I'm from Liverpool, over in the UK originally, but I've been here in Wellington for about three and a half years or so. Love the place, been working with Sparks Interactive for that time as well, and also love that place. You might see that I'm just bouncing around here, that's a mix of probably nervous energy, but also I'm a recent father for the first time, and so it's just my natural stance now. I always think I have a baby on me, and so I'm moving about from there. Anyway, enough about me. So, um, what I'm talking about today, as I said, from a project management perspective, when I started writing this, I thought, how do I actually approach this? What, what do I talk about from a project management perspective? So I thought, what were the key elements from my perspective that I worked on for, for these two projects? And I narrowed it down to four things, um, mainly because they are four really key elements, but also because um, I like alliteration. And so we're going to talk about discovery, design, development, and delivery. I think that works especially well at a Drupal conference. Um, you might notice that a couple of these things here might not strictly be in the realm of project management, so designs and development. It's not things that I will have been doing myself. We have designers, we have developers. But what I want to talk about is how I can give our team and also the client, the platform, the tools to be able to, to work on that, to design and to develop. OK, first things first, so discovery. What are we building? So at the very start of a project, what are we actually going to be doing? And so we start to ask a few questions. First of all, what's in scope? Now, when um, this came out as a RFP and we were applying for the project, there was a lot of information around the current website, as it was. It was a Drupal 7 website. And Toy2 to Femmo wanted a, a rebuild of it. And so we could see what content types were in that existing website, what mapping elements were in there and um, what styles were being used. And so we started to have a look at that and think, um, how would we do this? How would we rebuild this in Drupal 9? And primarily, how does this fit with Sector? Now, if you don't know Sector, it's Sparks Interactive's Drupal distribution. It's a collection of Drupal core content types and IA that we see used on a regular basis throughout our clients. We install it and it just means that with any website, we're starting from step 20 because we have that collection of Drupal core of content types of IA rather than starting from step one. And so we start to have a look at what was in that Drupal 7 site and see, okay, how does this go into sector? I'll touch a little bit on our pricing model because um, I find it interesting personally. Um, I'll tell you how you put a price on something like this. And then um, just briefly, last thing on discovery is how do we put all these elements together to put a plan in place of how we're going to build. So first of all, um, what's in scope? We could see the content types, as I mentioned, and we start to match these to what we have set in sector out of the box. So for example, we have content type one, two, and three. We see, okay, um, they're going to match with sector page. So we have home page, we have landing pages, we have entry pages. These will fit with, with our version of page. We know that that's a really good step for us. We start to do this with all the content types that we can see in Drupal 7 and just match it one by one. What fits into page? What fits into resource that we have? What fits into news? These kind of things. Now, you'll see on the right-hand side there that we have custom elements. So these are things that existed in the Drupal 7 website that weren't necessarily a one-to-one -one match with something we had in sector. We thought, OK, this is where we're going to have to get creative. Um, We'll build custom content types uh, and see how we go um, a little bit more on how we manage that. So yeah, we start to map it to sector and go from there. Now coming to the pricing model, as I said, I find this very interesting. 
Some of your cells might find it very boring, depending on whether you like numbers or not, I guess. Um, also, possibly, if you're a developer, you might not like it. If you're in the more project management side of things, you might find this really interesting. So when you are pricing up a project, where do you start? How do you put a price on a project? And so, again, using content types as an example, what we do is we break it down. We have a look at example one. We know that this is a match the sector page as we have it. Then we start to think, OK, if we're building this, what do we need to do? There's going to be three elements here. It's going to be front-end theming, there's going to be Drupal site building, and there's going to be back-end coding. And so we go about doing some estimates based on that. I chat with the, the team who are going to be working on this, so our front-end developers, our back-end developers, our Drupal site builders, and start to get an idea of, OK, if we're building this, how many days do we think it's going to take? We put those days into a sheet here, and we say, OK, each of these elements for page may take us one day, for example. That then gives us a low-end estimation for a build for this content type of three days, which is X thousand dollars. Now, when we're working on projects, we want to be nice and agile. We, we don't want to just give a set price. We want to be flexible. How do we do that? Let's have a price range. So we have our low-end estimation. How do we come about getting a high-end estimation? We have a look at the, the individual deliverable. In this case, it was sector page, and we start to think about what might come up, what, what don't we know? What's the risk or uncertainty here? Now, for something like page, it might be relatively straightforward. So we say um, the risk here is 1.5. So if our low-end estimation is three days of work, we times that by 1.5, our high-end estimation is 4.5 days. There we go. We have a, a nice range for this individual deliverable. We do that right across the board. Not only content types, we do that across menus, across blocks that we're going to be building, across things like building in mapping elements into content migration. And slowly but surely, we come with a, an overall price that we can work with, and we say, OK, here's what we think we can build a, a website for you for, somewhere between this gap. Here. Enough on pricing. Um, next thing here that I want to talk about is when we're, discover when we're discovering the website and we're talking about the, this plan that I mentioned, how are we actually going to go about this? So the original scope for the website was to build one website. We were rebuilding lins.gov.nz. Now, I'm not sure if you caught uh, Dewa DeBoer's talk earlier on how to build your own MailChimp using Amazon SES. That's very relevant to one of these things here. So we were having a look at the, the scope, and two things jumped out at us. One of them was the online chart catalog. And this is a a tool that mariners can use to view charts of the sea and use it to um, ensure their navigational safety when they're out in New Zealand. The second part of that is the notice to mariners, and that's a subscription service that um, said mariners are able to use. They can subscribe to um, charts of different waters uh, around New Zealand and say, okay, every fortnight I'm going to be kept up to date with any chops and changes to, to these charts. We're looking at that and we're thinking, this is going to be heavily customized. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to go into it. A couple more things here. There's a different content management team who's looking after that content. So there's a different owner. Within the main lins.gov.nz website, it's the digital communications team who own a lot of the content. With the online chart catalog and notice to mariners, it was a hydrography team. So two different teams working on it, two different audiences as well. We have. Land Information New Zealand, lots, lots of audience focus around things that happen on the land. So how to purchase land here, how to access maps of New Zealand. For charts, it's not the land, you're focusing on the sea, so it's almost a different audience. So when we're looking at this, we're thinking, OK, if we have complexity that could be decoupled from the main website, we have a separate content management team and we have a separate audience, should we decouple this? And sure enough, we put a, a proposal together and said, rather than making one website, let's make two. And so um, we then had to go back to the drawing board, put that into our plans. How's that going to work? Resourcing wise, timing wise, budget wise. And eventually, I'll show you the, these two websites that we've built. OK, enough on discovery. Uh, next element I want to talk about here is design. And so I said, design isn't something I'm going to be doing, but 
what can I do to, to help our designer or our designer? Now, we were given access to Lynn's brand guidelines to be able to go off, but we didn't quite think that that gave us the direction in where we wanted to go and what we wanted to design. And so what were our design objectives? And so I was speaking with our designer and I thought, how can I help here? What, what do we do? And so we thought, let's create a design brief. Let's ask some questions um, and then have something that we can actually reference back when we're designing. So the questions we wanted to ask were learning why. Why are we redesigning? What do you like or what do you necessarily not like from the current design in Drupal 7? What can we do better from that? Knowing who, so who are Toy Tutor Firmware Land Information New Zealand? Who are the audience? Who should we be designing for? We can, um, we can create certain elements and designs based on the audience and based on the client. And defining the what, what exactly are these objectives? We want things that we can reference back rather than just sending off a design and hoping that it's going to um, be approved and we can put it into build. Can we have things that we can actually relate back to and say, okay, we've ticked this box, we've ticked this box, shall we move forward? So we spoke with the Linz team and um, we put together this design brief. Now this is only one snapshot of the overall document that we came back with, but it was a really fantastic process with us and it gave our designer the tools needed to actually go ahead. And so a couple of things I wanted to point out here are that um, objectives that came through that, that really shone uh, above others where they wanted a customer-centric design. So they wanted it to be modern, reflect modern standards, um, lots of rich content, so lots of use of images and interactive maps to land information New Zealand after all. We definitely want to be doing that. Reduce visual clutter. Clarity is everything, so make it a, a lovely experience for the user. And um, use information that is inclusive and accessible. And more information are on that shortly, especially in the accessibility side, but something that we wanted to address from a design perspective. The next thing here was a new art direction. and so. As our designers started to, to put some images into the design, some of these were using aerial imagery, and we got great feedback from that. Um, everyone at the, the client side, Toy to Femware, loved this use of aerial imagery. It really showed that they were the custodians of, of the land and of the waterways, and that image of looking down at the water just really fed back into to what we wanted to do. And so, um, from there, what I'm going to do is actually going to, to show you some of these designs actually in practice. So this is lins.gov.nz and you'll see a couple of things that I've mentioned here. And so first of all, the, the hero image is of this aerial view looking down. So this is showing Tauranga Harbour over up north um, from here. But it's a, a lovely view showing both the land and seas here. And you'll see that um, there's Really nice clarity on the website. As I scroll down here as well, we have the introduction of Maori motifs, something that we wanted to include within the website. Great use of imagery here again, and then things like this, bringing in nice shapes and curves to the website. Um, when we spoke about this, it was really showing how this image is almost hugging the content within the website, and it was just that, that relation that we wanted to create that a user could visually experience from here going to go to another tab here and just show you again more of this imagery that Linz have been putting together. Um, it's really nice just having that directive that when we're adding images to the site, this is what we want to include. And so some fantastic use of imagery in here. Again, we're going to see some of the, the motifs as I scroll down. And I think it was just a really good practice, us defining what we wanted to get from design and then being able to reference back to it. And so as we work through designs and development, have we done this? Have we done this? Yes, we have. That's a nice thing. Okay, let me... This here. Okay, enough on design and into development. So how are we building this time? Again, something that I can't do myself. I'm not a developer. I'm not that smart. I'm not that dedicated to one specific thing. I, I, it's, yeah, too much for me. These, these guys are geniuses, magicians, it's to call them. But something I can help out with is providing direction. And where can I help on that? 
In this case, definitely on the accessibility front. So right from the off from this project, we said that we wanted to build this and we wanted to develop this. Uh, when it was just going to be one product, lins.gov.nz, we wanted it to make it as accessible as possible. We really wanted to be inclusive and um, it's something that we like to do within every project that we work on on Sector. As we were talking about this in the early days, there was fantastic buy-in from um, the team at Linz themselves that, yeah, let's do that. Let's make it a real thing and a real aim and goal for this project. What can I do from my side? And so I said that we build in, a, uh, in an accessible way and we use tools to check our own work, but how do we actually measure that? There are things that we don't know. And so, again, we spoke with the Linz team. How can we do this better? And again, there's great buy-in from that. And we partnered with a third-party company called Intopia. And during the build, the idea was, I'd speak with the team here. Perhaps we're working on element A of the website. Element A may be web forms or maybe mapping. We're creating it and we're building as accessibly as possible, but what don't we know? And so we can send over our work in development to um, the team at Intopia, along with any designs to accompany that and just get them to review it. And we just went through an iterative process where we send things off to them. They come back and say, you're doing this great, you're doing this great. You could do this better or you could introduce this. And it was a really great and steep learning curve for us. Lots of great um, things that we can put back into sector. And so we've seen amazing results from this, not only in the Linz website, but things that we can put back into the community. And so, um, again, let me just jump into here and show you a couple of these. So here we have a map of New Zealand. Now, if you're visiting Wellington, maybe you hang around here for a few days and you want to go hiking. So what do you want to check? You want to check the topographic maps. Check out this map user. This is really great. And before I say this, um, this is a really proud moment for me. I've always loved maps as a kid. And so being able to stand in front of you all here and present some maps, it's pretty cool. So let's see here. This up. And we can just see these lovely maps that are embedded into the website. You have the option to download those and ensure your own safety as you're hiking around Wellington. Jump back as well. And start to tab through. You'll see the, um, the work that our front-end developers have done on just creating structural elements. So as you're working through these maps, um, it's nice and accessible. It's very structurally ordered. And um, some of the feedback that we got from Intopia as they were working on this, that the mapping elements in particular were some of the best they've ever seen from an accessibility. So from maps into charts. So perhaps you're here in Wellington for a few days and you want to go out on a boat. How do you do that? Let's check the charts. Let's make sure we're nice and safe. Here's a point where I type and spell things wrong because that's what everyone does when typing the Google. And here we go. Let's have a look at a Wellington Harbour here. Um, out here, but you can see all these overlays. These are different charts within New Zealand, and um, you're able to access these, view actual charts of New Zealand. So again, lots of great work there. And once again, just go back to view it and hit into this to tab through these elements. Again, you'll see this great structural order that's been set up there, nice and accessible. And so, yeah, really proud of, of this product. Fantastic work in building this. Okay. Jump presentation again. And now on to the, the fourth element that I want to talk about here, um, delivery. So more of a focus on the project management side of things. How did we get to where we want? Quite simply, we did this through fortnightly sprints. So we wanted to be agile. Sprints is a great way to do that. And so we'd use a Trello board to manage tasks and topics. Before getting into a sprint, we would do something called pre-sprint planning, which 
I'm glad I've said properly because the amount of times I've said spree sprint planning and things like that over the project over a year and a half, it was countless times. Good on me. Um, so this pre, pre <laughs> second time around guitar, pre-sprint planning, um, we would work with the team and we'd say, okay, from our side, these are the priorities that we want to work on over the next fortnight. It could be designing content type A. It could be doing the front-end development of content type B. And off. It could be doing these accessible elements of, of the mapping uh, integration in the website. We'd speak with the, the client as well. What do we want to prioritize from their side? Perhaps there's a certain team at Linz who have a particular window for testing. Okay, let's make sure that we can be on track with them and we can marry it all together. So we do this pre-sprint planning. It was really important that we'd have clearly defined. So everyone knew their role. Within Trello, we would assign people to each card and then individual tasks within each. We set it within manageable chunks as well. We didn't want to overpromise what we could do within a two week window. And so we'd go about just formulating our plans. We knew the overall scope. How did we get there? We put it into it. Now what we did uh, as well uh, along the process was just having regular workshops. Perhaps in a month's time, we knew that we were going to be building a certain element of the website that we didn't have complete clarity on from our side. Perhaps we were building part of the website that um, we were unsure of the audience or we were unsure of the team who was going to be managing the content. And so what we'd do is ahead of time, we'd have a workshop, we'd get everyone in, in the room, ask all the right questions in the hope that we get all. That means that by the time it comes to, to the build in a month's time, we know the audience, we know the content management team, we, we can work through things. We'd also have regular progress meetings whereby a couple of times a week, we'd just jump on a call for 15 minutes and we'd say, this is what we've been working on. This is the progress here. Let's have a quick chat about this. Any news from this task? Any news from this task? Just have regular chat. Next thing I want to talk about from a project management perspective is um, something called a RAG report. Now, if you're not aware of this, it is essentially a breakdown of all the open deliverables that you're working on on a project and you assign them a color, be it red, amber, or green. Now, if something is green, it means that we're working on it and everything's fine. We know everything that we need to know. Everything's going well from a build perspective. We don't need to focus any attention for the time being because we're happy with where we are. If we assign something the color amber, it means that we're able to work on it, but perhaps there's things that we still need to figure out. If so, let's have a workshop, Let, let's figure out what needs to be figured out. If we've highlighted something to be red, it means that we currently have a roadblock and we're unable to progress within that deliverable for whatever reason. And if that's the case, we just assign it. Um, it's the best way of putting it. We, we make sure it's a priority. So how can we turn it from red to amber or red to green? And so again, prioritize it and ask these questions, get the right answers, allow us progress. Um, a couple of days ago, I was doing this presentation at home with my partner and I, I ran through this. And that's really interesting actually, but why do you use red, amber and green and not red, orange and green? It's a good question. And we both came to the conclusion that's probably because ROG report just sounds weird, I think. <laughs> RAG report's much better and so let's, let's go with amber. Okay, so um, the end products, I've touched on them a little bit here, showing you the, the lins.gov.nz website and charts.gov.nz. Um, but I'd love for you all to, to go away whilst you're here. Check out those maps to ensure your safety whilst hiking. Check out those charts to ensure your safety while sailing around New Zealand waters. Um, yeah, have a good time on them. We're really proud uh, of the, the product and website that we built. It was a, a, a really fun, excellent project. And yeah, please check them out. But for the time being, are there any questions at all? Thank you. Yeah, good question. So um, the question was around how we factored in the accessibility elements and the time that's going to be spent there. So sending reports for the team and then work. And so um, the answer is from a discovery perspective, um, that was done rather loosely, to be honest. We ensured that for everything that we were building, we thought about accessibility. And so um, when I talk about risk and saying, 
how do we add that in? We made sure that there was range for us to, to work on within there. Then when it came to the actual product, it, sorry, the actual time itself, working on accessibility, we would essentially review where we're up to. We'd have a look at these deliverables. If we're looking at mapping a, a web form, we'd say, okay, we still have this allowance that we want to, to work to here. This is what we factored in for accessibility. Let's go for it. Um, if it meant spending more time on a certain deliverable, so be it. We wanted to be agile, we wanted to be flexible. We'd just make it work. We'd know that if we spent more time there, it just means that we may not be able to spend more time on, on other elements. But uh, there were things that we needed help on from, accessibil from an accessibility perspective more than others. And so we would focus on them and priority. Okay, so uh, the first question there was around, um, yeah, custom object models. That, there, there was a lot within the website. We see these mapping elements um, and how we went about estimating that and whether it was true. And so the answer is we received a lot of good information um, by two systems here. So first of all, when we were going through the documentation that I sent out as part of the RFP, there was a breakdown uh, of things and it was saying, these mapping elements are used, for example, and then we would be able to go and do our own research and see the compatibility going from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9. The second element of this was that um, early on in the project, we were given access to a dump of the previous website, minus things that we shouldn't have access to. And so we were able to just go in and really have a look at that ourselves. And then, um, to be honest, hope that it matched with what we'd done to a discovery perspective. A lot of it was pretty on point, and so it helped that we did, did that in. The second question that you asked there was how we factor in things like project management. And so what we did for this project was um, we just give it a percentage total. So if we say overall budget is, or overall estimation is such and such, project management would be 15 or so that. So we just take that as an overall figure, and we think that's probably a reasonable figure that would cover everything. Yeah, so uh, the question there was around uh, accessibility and a, a review process from that. And so what we did was we had certain goals almost that we wanted when we were going to prod, um, when we were going live, sorry, with the websites. Now we know that accessibility is it's ever changing. And so you can always work on accessibility. Even beyond us going live, what we said was we'll do a real audit and review of the website. So that's something we've been continually working on within Topia. They go away, do a report, and come back to us saying, these are all the things that you can do better. And then um, the team here at Sparks, uh, we'd work with the team at Linz and say, what do we want to prioritize? And so we had that list of everything that we wanted to work on. And we would go about prioritizing it and um, doing it beyond Project Go Live, but really making sure that we can get to where we wanted to be. Yes, we, we did have that, that goal or goals, and um, yeah, we've been working, working through it. It's been a, a great process.